Well, good evening. I am Mike Gerhardt, a scholar in residence here at the National Constitution Center, and always thrilled to be a part of an event here. And it's a special event, of course, and it's really wonderful to have all of you, having our members here, having those of you, all of you, who are so near and dear to us and make this place possible, but also we expect you to be fully educated and fully informed about um, the Constitution. And this is a wonderful program that will enrich our constitutional un understanding further. So I really want to thank all of you for taking the time to join us tonight. Um, as you all well know, our guest tonight is uh, Professor Ralph Young of Temple. He is a professor of history and he is the winner of several major teaching awards, including the Provost Award for Innovative Teaching in General Education, the College of Liberal Arts Distinguished Teaching Award, Honors Professor of the Year, and most recently the Lenbach Foundation Award for Teaching Excellence. Excellence. His book, Descent, The History of an American Idea, was a finalist for the 2016 Phi Beta Kappa Ralph Waldo Emerson Award, and he will be staying afterwards tonight to sign copies of his book with you. He's also the editor of Dissent in America, Voices That Shaped a Nation, a compilation of more than 100 documents by American dissenters. He's frequently interviewed and quoted by such media outlets as the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, CBS, NPR, CNN, and Sirius XM. And of course, most importantly, he's here with us tonight. Uh, <laughs> This is a remarkable book. It's a really a story about America. Um, and perhaps the best place to begin, Ralph, is with what is distinctive about dissent and how it's special to America. Well, the your basic thesis of the book is that dissent is central to American history. That uh, we were... Maybe we were, speak up just a little okay. bit. We were born out of dissent and we put dissent into our founding documents and we dissenting ever since. You know, in the 17th century, uh, religious dissenters, Quakers, Puritans, and others settled colonies uh, in the New World. Uh, and no sooner had they got here than people began dissenting amongst them, like Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson in Massachusetts. You had uh, Bacon's Rebellion in the 17th century. By the time you get into the 18th century, uh, you have a lot of political dissent rising up, which of course, as you all know, culminates in the American Revolution, uh, which is kind of another level of dissent. <laughs> uh, and then after the revolution, uh, we, put into, uh, we put into the founding document, is this on? Um, okay. It has to warm up. Oh, I, I hear. No. Okay. My students always complain to me that I don't talk loudly enough either. <laughs> so it's always on my uh, student feedback forms at the end of the semester. And, uh, and they have a lot younger ears too, <laughs> even than me. <laughs> so anyway, I was, I was saying that so in the 18th century, you know, you had the American Revolution and the founding fathers, they were all so well aware of the role that dissent played in the beginnings of the United States that they put it into the First Amendment of the Constitution. And it's kind of an interesting thing that an interesting thing that in the, the with the Constitution, you know, the, the, the in the First Amendment, uh, three of the items in the First Amendment were actually uh, created during the colonial period. It was Roger Williams who came up with the idea of separation of church and state and religious liberty. And it was John Peter Zenger in the 18th century, the idea of freedom of press. So these things actually existed before the United States. And the Founding Fathers were well enough aware of this, that dissent plays such an important role that we have that right to dissent also in the First Amendment. And Americans haven't shut up since. <laughs> you know, we, in the 19th century, you had women fighting for the right to vote. You had abolitionists fighting against slavery. You had workers fighting for the right to organize unions. Uh, you had eventually then so much of this dissent, especially the anti-slavery movement, leads to the Civil War. During the Civil War, you had dissent on both sides. You know, and I, I talk about this in the book, the chapter on the Civil War. You had 
northerners dissenting against the northern effort to fight the war, and you had southerners dissenting against the Confederate effort. Um, both Lincoln and Jefferson Davis suspended the writ of habeas corpus, which led to lots of protests in both sections of the country. Well, the two sections, yeah. Uh, after the war, you had the beginnings of a civil rights movement. You had the labor movement really kicking into higher gear with the Haymarket uh, riots, the um, so many strikes. Uh, you had in the, the Pullman strike in the 1890s where uh, Eugene V. Debs, the leader of the Railway Workers Union, was uh, incarcerated in jail for six months for having led this strike. And during his trial, people were accusing him of being a socialist. And he thought, well, since I've got six months in jail, I might as well read up what, what is this <laughs> socialist stuff. <laughs> So he read socialist literature and converted to socialism <laughs> while in jail. And he got out and he founded the American Socialist Party and, of course, ran for president five times. And then, you know, by 1900, you have the progressive movement, you have, uh, you know, moderate, you know, people protesting against, like, the, the way people that were suffering from the, the ills of industrial capitalism and they were, you know, people were fighting for their rights. You had uh, the beginning of much more radical movements. You had, you know, uh, not only Eugene V. Debs, but Big Bill Haywood and Joe Hill and Emma Goldman. And then, uh, you know, this kind of leads basically at the end of World War I to a Red Scare, and you have people protesting then. Uh, so all through, I mean, the 20th century, you, you not only had the civil rights movement, but you had all the rights movements that splintered off from that, you know, uh, women's liberation, you know, environmentalism, the LGBTQ movements, the American Indian movement, Chicano, uh, you name it, even there were, there were even the White Panthers, I mean the Great Panthers, you guys heard of them? Maggie Kuhn, Philadelphia, that started here. The, uh, so you had all of this, and then all throughout this, every single war in American history has had its dissenters, including the Revolution, including the Good War, including the Second World War. Uh, maybe there wasn't quite as much dissent against the Second World War as other wars, but you did have lots of conscientious objectors. And of course, you know, recent years, you know, with, with Vietnam, Iraq, and now, the new reality since 2016, we have, I think, a new birth of dissent. <laughs> uh, it seems like everybody is dissenting. And uh, so basically, you know, one of the themes, of course, of the book is that not only is dissent central to our history, it's, it's in our DNA. And it's probably one of the most uh, ultimate expressions of our Americanness, of our patriotism, is when we dissent. And so naturally, if you would ask me, what do I think of Colin Kaepernick? I think that's great <laughs> that he does. He's acting in the American tradition, and so many, you know, other things like this. And uh, so, you know, this is basically the the th theme of the book. And the idea that you know the subtitle, "History of an American Idea," it's not really. I mean, we didn't create dissent. I mean, dissent created us, but we have kind of honed it and refined it into almost a. Uh, like a religious thing in our country that you know people will dissent uh, for pretty much anything now. Well, of course you've, you've you've done a fabulous job of walking us through this book and through our own history. Um, and dissent, as you point out, um, characterizes America. America is born in dissent. Dissent is part of every period of American history. Uh, one thing I want to just explore a little bit further at the outset of our conversation is how do we recognize dissent? How do we figure out when there is dissent um, at any given period? Well, you know, there were some periods where dissent kind of really, you know, expands very, you know, almost exponentially, like in the, um, the progressive period or in the 1960s. Uh, and I think it's, it's happening now, right, you know, at the moment. Uh, but there are times where things are pretty quiet, people are pretty much satisfied with the status quo. But there's always somebody who is feeling that somehow their rights are not being fulfilled. They're not experiencing the fullness of the American promise. And so, uh, you know, they, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing about dissent is that 
dissenters are frequently using the founding documents to back up their argument. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll quote the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution as, you know, their uh, evidence for that, you know, we have a right to, to express this opinion about this. Because what it is is that I think a lot of people consider the Constitution and the Declaration almost like a contract. You know, the United States has signed this contract, you know, we will protect your rights, we make sure that you have every opportunity to experience equality and opportunity. Uh, and some people, you know, whether it was women or African Americans or, you know, the gay, lesbians and gays, at some point they, it was like dawning on them, hey, you know, we're not experiencing all these rights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, dissenters are often holding the establishment's feet to the fire, so to speak. You know, you said this, now live up to your part of the contract. Well, some, and, and of course, as you point out in the book, and as you've already s suggested today, um, dissent sometimes turns into a victory, and sometimes dissent doesn't. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. dissent remains, in, in a sense, in a minority status. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe there to keep us honest, maybe there to provide some check against the status quo, mm -hmm. uh, maybe as a measure, uh, a way to measure the status quo. Uh, I want to take us then through some of that history mm -hmm. you've just talked about, and maybe zero in on some of the more distinctive dissents um, mm -hmm. that we've experienced uh, as a country. Um, the American Revolution, which is now, of course, the focus of a great new museum here in town, mm -hmm. um, is one of the great examples of dissent mm -hmm. in world history. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about that mm -hmm. great initial descent, yeah. um, the, which of course we now know of as giving rise to our Constitution. But let's go back to that descent. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little more how it had started um, and how it sort of mobilized mm -hmm. over yeah. time. Well, there was, you know, all through the 18th century, there were a lot of things happening, you know, various colonial wars that the American colonists were fighting alongside England against usually the French and the Spanish. But uh, by the end of the French and Indian War, the Americans were frequently sort of smarting under the kind of withering criticism a lot of the, you know, the English military was bringing to the, you know, the, like it was like the British soldiers during the French and Indian War that began referring to the colonists more like as Americans hmm. and not Massachusetts, I mean, was, most of the colonists thought of themselves as British and then their colony. Um, but you know, the, when the British were starting to use that term Americans, they were basically using it as a pejorative term. It meant, in other words, it meant they were not sufficiently British. And, um, but the French and Indian War kind of almost bankrupted the English treasury. And I'm sure that a lot of you are very well aware of this, that you know, Parliament and George III decided that since that war was held to uh, protect the colonists from the French and the Indians, uh, they should pay for it. And besides, they're not paying as much in taxes as their English counterparts. And this is something that we, we tend to neglect in our patriotic fervor about this time, that uh, most American colonists, say, say an average yeoman farmer who maybe owned 60 acres of land, uh, he was paying about one-tenth as much a year in taxes as his English counterpart. Mm -hmm. And Parliament figured this should be rectified. Colonists didn't go like, <laughs> go for that, <laughs> as you know. And of course, it, it goes through stages. Mm -hmm. Most dissent movements, you know, like some people, they com grumble, they complain, they write letters, they sign petitions. Things don't get addressed, they start taking to the streets, they demonstrate, they boycott. Uh, when the, very, the stamp tax came in and then the tea taxes, they would tar and feather revenue officials <laughs> and all, and it just was getting more and more violent. And eventually, of course, with Lexington and Concord, um, it, it kind of created a situation where the colon nobody really knew what was happening. Okay, blood was shed. Are we still, are we just protesting or are we starting a revolution? And of course then Congress meeting right over here for, mm. from about April of 75, all the way through to, into 19, uh, 1776, we're debating that. 
Are we petitioning to redress our grievances? Are we fighting a war? And of course, who was it that came along and said, you guys are crazy, you're fighting a war. You guys know who I'm talking about? He wrote a pamphlet that was published in Thomas Paine, the, the, the January 76th. It's going to be a test later, so we've got to <laughs> So he, you know, he wrote Common Sense, and he said, of course, you know, it's ridiculous to be debating anything. You should be getting an army together and fighting, because one of the examples he gives in Common Sense is that where in nature does the primary planet revolve around the secondary planet? You know, the moon <laughs> revolves around the Earth. The Earth revolves around the sun. It's ridiculous that the North America should revolve around an island. Hmm. You know, these are the kinds of examples he gave, which were, you know, everybody thought, hey, this is, this is common sense. And then, of course, once it really becomes this bloody affair, you know, hmm. it's maybe hard to define it as dissent anymore. It's outright warfare. But it's kind of, you know, one of the things that I, I often try to get my students talking about in my Descent in America class because we all agree we're in favor of nonviolent dissent. But what about violent dissent? You know, and most people say, well, you know, we don't like that, but the American Revolution, you know, the Civil War, you know, John Brown's raid. I mean, there have been examples of very violent dissent in our nation's history that we actually kind of glorify now. There have been other examples of violent dissent which we still vilify, right. but um, so it becomes a very complex thing, you know, dissent, where is there a place for going that extra step where you're not just maybe protesting or maybe doing a little property damage like throwing tea into a harbor, but, you know, actually shedding blood. Now, of course, these dissenters we're talking about uh, go by a different name today. They may be called the framers. Um, uh, patriots. Some of them, or patriots. Some of them will become. But we delegates. don't like the word patriot in Philadelphia. Right. Lately, right? <laughs> well, I think we we uh, took care of that, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we settled we settled that, um, and now there's dissent brewing in a different quarter. Um, but once you win, um, and you gain power, and you come into power, and you have a constitution that, of course, is in effect, um, then. Uh, the people in power, let's say John Adams, who is the first vice president and then becomes president, uh, has to experience some dissent. And so one of the interesting dissenters um, that emerges early in our history is a guy, oops, oops, um, is a guy yeah. named Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, with the um, alien and sit, you know. And so, so let's talk about Thomas Jefferson's dissent. Yeah, well, you know, he, uh, of course, this kind of creates the you know, first political party system with, uh, you know, which Washington was so upset about that is, you know, his beloved cabinet just couldn't see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jefferson was, you know, and it's interesting because we think that today, you know, we have really nastiness going on <laughs> in politics, but it was just as nasty back then. These guys were, you know, they would dig up s horrible stories about each other, you know, the affairs that they had, you know, extramarital re relationship, you know, Jefferson, Hamilton, they all were doing this. But um, eventually, uh, John Adams, you know, in, signed into law the Alien and Sedition mm -hmm. Acts to, you know, suppress the Jeffersonians, basically, which... Uh, they protested very vigorously as an infringement of the First Amendment of the Constitution, and it was, you know, pretty successful dissent there. Um, but, you know, you have so many, you know, it, it kind of a curiosity, you know, like almost every dissent movement that is successful or, or is even moving towards success kind of creates its own dissent movement against mm -hmm. them. It's almost like the, the dialectic um, that's going on. You had once, like for example, as the patriot movement towards revolution was getting more and more successful, loyalists who had been the power structure now found themselves protesting against mm -hmm. these protesters. Uh, Thomas Hutchinson was one of the leading ones. He, um, when Jefferson wrote you know, those lofty words in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and 
and the whole declaration, you know, Thomas Jefferson published a, a pamphlet which was called Strictures Against the Declaration. Hmm. And he took the entire Declaration of Independence and tore it apart and showed how inconsistent and, and full of fallacies it was. And he quotes, you know, every paragraph from the Declaration and then refutes it. And he says, like, for example, uh, all men are created equal and, and that we hold these right, you know, we have these, uh, uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, inalienable rights. And he says, I would like to, I would be impertinent if I would ask the delegates from Carolinas, Maryland, and Virginia uh, how these rights could be so inalienable when they deny them to over 100,000 Africans. And pointing out that, you know, obviously they are alienable. <laughs> They've been taken away from people. So this is the kind of things that was happening. But you have, again, you know, somebody who was part of had a power structure that had protesters against it now finds himself on the outside protesting against the new reality. And of course, Jefferson will, uh, I guess we could say, successfully dissent to um, Adams and eventually prevails in an election against Adams and becomes president. Mm -hmm. But then as president, he's going to have to wrestle with something, of course, that's going to define dissent mm -hmm. for the next several decades, and that's slavery. And you've yes. already introduced yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and so tell us about how that dissent of sla to, to slavery sort of manifests itself and works itself out over the next few decades. Well, that's, you know, one can write several books right. just on that, and, there, and maybe thousands of books have been written on that. but. Uh, you know, there was, you know, in that aftermath of the revolution, so many Americans felt tremendous pride about, you know, we beat the most powerful army and navy in the world. You know, we're an independent nation and we are a government, the first government that has a constitution that says we the people. And, you know, so people were so really proud of democracy. And thinking that we are the greatest country that ever lived. But it slowly dawned on people by the 1810s and 1820s, well, you know, this is a wonderful democracy, but there's this thing called slavery. <laughs> and, and women don't really have any rights. And look what we've done to the Indians. And workers, you know, or, you know because the Industrial Revolution was just starting. You know. So, mm -hmm it kind of got a lot of people thinking that we need to reform things. And this kind of coincided with a lot of other things like the romantic movement ideas coming in from Europe, French utopian socialist ideas, and also the Second Great Awakening where people are having these revival experiences. I heard that Billy Graham just died today, mm -hmm. speaking of revivals. Uh, the, um, but there have, and, and people were thinking, you know, if they can have some control or some agency in their spiritual salvation, then certainly we can do something to fix these problems that are keeping America from being a true democracy. And so this kind of got a lot of people more involved in things like the anti-slavery movement. Mm -hmm. And this grew, by the 1830s, it was becoming a very powerful force. And of course, the more powerful it got, the more you had pro-slavery people you know, coming up with new arguments, using the Bible, uh, using all sorts of arguments to uh, you know, validate slavery. And of course, they're doing this mainly because of the attacks that are coming in. Mm -hmm. And of course, this just builds up and builds up until by the time you get to the 1850s, it's like today. <laughs> people, well. people think there's no way to Compromise. Yes, and so uh, we, maybe we'll settle, we'll come to the 1850s. Um, and so in the 1850s, we, uh, slavery, of course, is becoming increasingly um, the issue that defines parties, defines government, uh, defines the country, rips the country, of course, ultimately uh, in half. But before we get to the Civil War, there's, there's another, uh, maybe a good, a good thing to talk about is how dissent is manifesting itself across the country. Kansas, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. is one of the places that is ripped apart and maybe is uh, a good thing to talk about because dissent um, over Kansas becomes a very important defining yeah. Yeah. part of the 1850s. And, and one of the sparks that 
sets off the Civil War. Right. I mean, one could say that five or six years before the Civil War began, it began in Kansas. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you are probably aware of the, the Can Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was to create territories there so the Transcontinental Railroad could be built through it. And uh, this idea that the states could come in under the uh, aegis of popular sovereignty shocked a lot of people because it basically overturns the Missouri Compromise. But uh, what it did is that once Kansas started getting some population in it, you wound up getting hundreds and hundreds of people from Missouri, which was a slave state, pouring into Kansas so that they could boost the pro-slavery population so that when they would write a constitution to come in as a state, it would be a pro-slavery constitution. Once they started doing that, you had people like uh, Henry Ward Beecher and other mis uh, ministers in Massachusetts and transcendentalists beginning to urge people to go in who were against slavery. And so you had anti-slavery people moving in. You know, you, have you heard of Beecher's Bibles? The uh, Henry Ward Beecher urged uh, people to go and settle in Kansas and take a Bible and a gun with them. You know? And so people call them the, the gun Beecher's Bibles. And of course, one of the people that heeded that call was John Brown with several friends and family. And one night they raided an anti, a pro-slavery settlement and dragged, I think, five pro-slavery settlers out of their beds and hacked them to death with broadswords. Um, the rest of the, uh, the pro-slavery settlement, when they woke up the next morning, when they found these body parts were not amused. So they went to the, the anti-slavery settlement that John Brown was from and killed some anti-slavery settlers, including John Brown's son. And this just sparked off what has been called bleeding Kansas. You know, over the next couple of months, hundreds of people on both sides were killed in this guerrilla warfare. Um, John Brown left Kansas went to New England, gave like a speaking tour, raising money for his next idea, which was the Harper's Ferry Raid. Uh, he even, you know, he got money from Frederick Douglass, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, yes. a lot of very eminent people donated to his cause. And then in 1859, of course, uh, he raided Harper's Ferry and um, was caught, executed, and becomes kind of the, the spark, really, that, what is it, Melville calls him the meteor, the, uh, that kind of set off the civil, civil War. And of course, in the South, he was a villain, a demon, Lucifer himself. Uh, in the North, he was a hero. And of course, Lincoln's election and right. the war. And of course, there are a lot of people we know of as being important historical figures who are really involved with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Stephen Douglas is one of the architects of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, and then there's this little known figure um, who is uh, to some extent really defining himself through dissent in the 40s and 50s, um, a one-term congressman named Lincoln who protests against James Polk, uh, dissents to Polk's administration, yep. tries to def get a resolution through Congress um, really uh, blaming uh, Polk for the uh, illegal war in Mexico. Uh, and Lincoln is sort of wandering through the 50s, 1850s, out of office, um, trying to figure out a way to get back in. Mm -hmm. um, he eventually does figure out a way to get back in. Yeah, by they, being against the Kansas-Nebraska yeah, Act. Yes, by being against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And so now, let's talk about Lincoln having been dissenter, now he's the president, dealing with perhaps the greatest dissent mm -hmm. in American history, the right. Civil War. Yeah. I mean, in that dissent by the South, if had it succeeded, you know, the United States would no longer exist the way we know it today. And kind of, if you think about it, you know, it would have set the precedent for more sections to secede. You know, New England would have seceded. California definitely would have seceded. Uh, so we would have like several different republics here. And would we have been able to withstand Hitler, you know, in World War II? I mean, the the your mind boggles when you go into these what ifs about history, but Lincoln uh, 
you know, found himself in the situation. He did not want this war, but he had sworn an oath to protect and preserve the Union and the Constitution, and it was his duty to keep the Union together. And uh, he wound up, you know, first, you know, think of the South, the whole Confederacy is dissenting against the idea of the United States. But once Lincoln is in office and he starts doing things that wind up getting a lot of people dissenting hmm. against him in the North. Like, for example, you, you know, it was very important to keep the border states within the Union. What were the four border states? You guys know, here's a quiz. Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri. Missouri. West Virginia is another whole story of dissent in itself. <laughs> there, I get it. But uh, so to keep those, it was very important. And during the early stages, right after Fort Sumter, Maryland was calling, uh, you know, a um, convention to vote on an ordinance of secession. And Lincoln knew that Maryland, there was enough votes for it to pass. And so if Maryland seceded, it would mean Washington, D.C. would be inside the Confederacy, you know, and the whole government would be captured. So he arrested a number of members of the uh, legislature and also the mayor of Baltimore and the governor of Ma Maryland and suspended habeas corpus. This created a wave of dissent uh, against Lincoln's policies here. And of course, he always said later on, it was necessary for him to break, to break part of the Constitution in order to save the Constitution. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting. I remember when I was first really getting into this with my book, and it was around the time that we passed the Patriot Act. And I was protesting against the Patriot Act. And I suddenly thought that my greatest hero in American history Lincoln, had I been alive at that time, I might have been protesting against him <laughs> for suspending habeas corpus. And, and well, he authorized wiretapping. Of course, it was no telephones then, but it was the telegraph was wiretapped. You know, Edward, <laughs> Edward Snowden would have been a... You know, <laughs> well, there are a lot of people dissenting against Lincoln, but perhaps we're fortunate that a lot of people didn't dissent against yeah. Lincoln. Um, and Lincoln, of course, has to maneuver through, navigate through an incredibly tough period, and eventually, of course, that dissent is settled. Um, and the settlement of the dissent uh, brings about Reconstruction, brings us into the 20th century. We're not going to be able to go through all the wonderful right. history you talk about in this book, um, which defines our country. Um, right. And eventually, um, yes, ma'am. very serious human rights violation, slavery, and that was a huge part of their motive to secede. Perhaps history would have taken a very different eye on the drastic things that Lincoln did mm -hmm. to protect the Union. They might have said that, that he was wrong to go to those extremes yeah. if it were not for the slavery issue. Yeah. Well, that could, that could very well be. Just like if uh, the English, if we had not won the American Revolution, uh, you know, Franklin, Jefferson, Washington, they would have, all would have been hanged, and we would be, you know, thinking of Thomas Hutchinson as this great patriot who kept us within the British Empire. Hmm. You know, like, uh, winners tend to write the history, you know, <laughs> and, as we know. But uh, as you were saying... Well, the, well, and of course, we can... Um, we have and will have programs on the 19th century coming up talking about Reconstruction mm -hmm. and the extraordinary period of Reconstruction. Um, if we t think about the early 20th century, dissent, of course, is going to become important there, too, uh, particularly dissent to the First World War. Yeah. The First World War at that time became probably the most protested war in our history. I think Vietnam later superseded that. But there was uh, you know, a tremendous amount of protest because partly... For many Americans, they didn't see the reason why we would have to get into that war. And also, about 20% of the American population at that time was of German extraction. They had no interest in fighting against their relatives in Germany. Another 
were of Irish extraction. And their attitude was any enemy of uh, England's is a friend of ours, right? And so, and then there were uh, conscientious objectors. There were, you know, were quite a few people. There were radicals, there were socialists. Emma Goldman, Eugene V. Debs, who had a lot, large following. They all were opposed to the war. So uh, in order to kind of create unity, which you know, everybody, every president always has to do in time of war. You want to get everybody behind you. Uh, they established the Office of Information, which is basically this propaganda arm of the executive branch, you know, pumping out all this anti-German propaganda so as to unite the people. Things like um, German language was no longer taught in schools. Um, the, uh, it got so f to the point where Frankfurters were renamed hot dogs, and uh, hamburgers were renamed Salisbury steak. And my favorite is um, sauerkraut was n renamed Liberty cabbage. <laughs> and, but, but actually, there were even uh, lynchings of German American citizens, mm. too. You know, it, was, uh, it suddenly, you know, the propaganda thing just worked so well as to unite people behind it. But still, there were, all through the war, there were lots of protests. And then when Congress passed and Wilson signed the uh, Sabotage and Espionage Acts, um, this created, you know, it, it got to the point where you couldn't even speak out against the war. Mm -hmm. You'd be arrested. And in 1918, about 2,000 people were arrested for that, including Eugene V. Debs. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, H.L. Mencken later pointed out that it's something so absurd about democracy is that the minute it feels under threat, it sabotages the thing that's most central to itself, you know, freedom of speech. And he says, imagine, you know, people during World War I protesting against these <laughs> acts that, you know, limited dissent, they would read the Bill of Rights out loud in Central Park and get arrested for it. You know, he's, H.L. Megan says, imagine, uh, you know, the Pope condemning someone as a heretic for proclaiming the divinity of Christ. You know, it's just kind of absurd the way, you know, things go like that. And of course, that um, dissent has itself is felt in a number of different ways, and it helps produce some electoral victories mm -hmm. in the aftermath of Wilson's administration. Um, but eventually, you find yourselves facing another world war. Yeah. And what happens to dissent during World War II? Well, dissent basically, there was dissent. There were kind of two kinds of groups. I mean, there were conscientious objectors, you know, people for religious reasons and all. Uh, David Dellinger, um, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of really, you know, significant people were protesting. And what in their protests, they would refused to go you know, register for the draft, and then they were put imprisoned. And some of them wound up you know, becoming medics. And you know, there was a film recently, uh, Hacksaw Ridge. Mm -hmm. Did any of that see that? Uh, about a, a conscientious objector who actually wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. You know, and he never carried a gun in the whole war. But he saved so many lives. Um, mm -hmm. There were also uh, people who were protesting the Second World War who uh, kind of in a more sophisticated political way, they were very angry that the United States banking interests had helped subsidize and arm Hitler. We had sent lots of loans to Germany in the 30s as Germany was coming to power. Uh, and you know, a lot of the people that were protesting against the war said that we helped give rise to Hitler. Now we're fighting against him. Um, but still, <clears throat> it was clear with Pearl Harbor and the horrors that the Third Reich was committing that, uh, you know, this is what so many Americans think of the Second World War as the good war, not because it was good, because no war is good, but there was a legitimate reason to fight it. And so dissent was not as strong during that war, but still there was some. Well, and we can oftentimes, of course, understand that dissent may, may, to some extent, be most acute or most intense when there is uh, um, armed conflict. Um, and we, we can identify that dissent mm -hmm. um, as it carries forth, of course, to the Korean War mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So what happens to dissent then? 
in during the Korean yes. War. You know, of, of you know, a lot of people were opposed to that too. It was similar, you know, like with with the Second World War, but the Korean War didn't have you know there wasn't that level of dissent because there was the this kind of paranoid fear about communism that was kind of saturating the country on you know, the McCarthy hearings, mm. House Committee on Un American Activities. And so people who would protest against the Korean War uh, stood a very strong chance of being labeled as, you know, a pinko, a communist, you know, a sympathizer. Uh, so that kind of limited dissent to some extent. But by the time you get, we get to the Vietnam War, and you have, you know, this baby boom generation, you know, coming of age for the draft, and uh, you know, really thinking about the things that were going on in in the world, and realizing that it, Vietnam did not seem like it was a threat to the United States. You know, we we knew we had we were, we were all being taught. Actually, probably a lot of you guys are in my generation too, and you you know, we remember how. Um, we were talking about the domino theory, you know, that it's better to fight against communism in the jungles of Vietnam than on the beaches of California, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. And, and at first, most of us, I mean, I, you know, w w had no objection to the war in Vietnam. I thought this is what we have to do. But as it kind of progressed, you know, personally for me, I started to think, something doesn't gel about this, you know, and I started reading a lot more literature. I would read, you know, pro, you know, you know arguments, you know, in magazines that why we should be there and arguments why we shouldn't be there. And eventually, you know, a couple of years in, maybe by 1966, personally, I had, you know, said that, you know, I'm against this war. And so I, you know, became an anti-war protester. Uh, for some other people, it took a bit longer than that. But by 1968, 50 years ago, can you believe? It seems like it was just yesterday, right? Um, by, you know, at the beginning of that year, uh, I would say most Americans were still in favor of our commitment. But by the end of that year, after Tet and assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and Chicago and the election, by the end of that year, it was, it was flipped. I think it was about 60% were against the war. And you can tell this, uh, it's interesting, you know, Michael and I were talking about the media before we came <coughs> in here. The, up until 1968, whenever you would read an article, say in Time Magazine, about an anti-war protest, it would say a bunch of scruffy, dirty hippies, you know, blah, blah, blah. By the end of 68, they were saying, uh, you know, priests and nuns <laughs> and mothers with babies in carriages. Yeah, they were just reporting on it differently. And you could see that once the media started shifting, which kind of always kind of uh, you know, begs the question, was the media following public opinion or was it directing public mm. opinion? You know, it's kind of an interesting thing about that well, here. Yes, sir. Johnson said that if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America or something yep, like that. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And of course, there, there's another really critical dissent that has arisen uh, roughly a little before uh, the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I don't want to lose sight of that important dissent. Mm -hmm. We know of it as the Civil Rights Movement. All right. And so what about dissent during that period? Yeah. Uh, the, the Sometimes people call it the second American Revolution or the finishing of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, you know, probably the most important dissent movement in our history because it really uh, shook America, you know, to some kind of conscious awakening. And, and I think it really helped that Martin Luther King was so influenced by Thoreau and Gandhi and the ideas of civil disobedience and turning the other cheek and you know peaceful protest, because you know if if those protests had been violent, it would have you know probably just turned off most of Middle America. But you know as Americans were hearing about what was happening in Montgomery, 
and then later in Little Rock. You know, it just kind of made people think that uh, some things have to change. And you got to remember, we, we were all brought up. You know, I heard this from grade school on. You guys did too. You know, we are living in the greatest country that ever existed. And I remember as a kid thinking, I love it that I'm living in the greatest country on earth. And we're, we're the greatest country because we're a democracy. Everybody's free and equal. And I just, I, I, I was over the moon, you know, in happiness about this. And then in September 1957, watching on television these nine black kids being escorted into Little Rock Central High School by the 101st Airborne, and something doesn't gel. Like, hey, we're told, you know, we're the greatest. The Soviet Union is the evil empire. Everything about them is evil. Everything about the United States is great. But it's not true. And I think this was one of the things that really was the spark of the 1960s where the civil rights movement really gets into high gear and then the anti-war movement begins, is that there were so many of us that saw this contradiction. You know, we love America, we love we the people, the democracy, all of that stuff. And it was, it's almost like a naive awakening, thinking, okay, we are the greatest country, but there's a couple of problems. Mm -hmm. So let's fix them so that the reality more closely resembles the ideal image we have of ourselves. And I think both consciously and unconsciously, that's what kind of was the underlying motivating factor for this, the so-called 60s rebellion. And then not only with, with civil rights and trying to correct that and then correcting, you know, if the United States is involved in what many of us thought was an immoral war, we have to make America be great and not be involved in something like that. But then also what happened alongside of this, and this is maybe what, one reason why it was one of the greatest ages of dissent in our history, is that you know, when we were young and we are aware that there's this injustice about race and the government isn't doing enough to correct it, and if we're aware that we shouldn't be in Vietnam and the government isn't doing enough, and it starts making you think maybe they're lying to us about everything. And so suddenly you wind up getting the counterculture that begins questioning all of American values. And so this all comes together. It's like a perfect storm in the 1960s. And, uh, you know, it's partly the baby boom, you know, this large generation that felt its power. But so many things happening. And, uh, you know, it's interesting when I first developed the course at Temple, Descent in America, I thought it was primarily going to deal with the 60s <laughs> because it was, you know, for me, the golden age of yeah. dissent. But as I began putting the course together and getting readings and documents and then writing that book, it struck me that this is just, you know, one of many decades that we've had dissent, that it's in our DNA, it's all part of our history. And so today when you, you dissent, or somebody else you know dissents, you know that they're just acting in this long American tradition. And you know, I think one thing we can sort of expect, you know, we don't know what the future is going to bring, but I can, be, I can almost guarantee there'll still be dissent. <laughs> well, after the Civil Rights Movement, uh, share with us what you think is perhaps the most significant dissent hmm. after that. Well, there's been, well, I mean, it's just so many different things. I mean, the environmental movement is really important. Uh, the, uh, you know, lately, of course, this Black Lives Matter, it kind of emphasizes the fact that the civil rights movement has not really achieved the, uh, you know, a post-racial society. Um, the LGBTQ movement. And one of the things that's also kind of interesting, if you think, how long it took, I mean, slavery ended in 1865. And by the time Jim Crow gets ended, that's, you know, we're like 1968, really. That, it's a long period of time. You know, the, the gay rights movement sort of begins really in 1969 and you have marriage equality already. So it's like an amazing speed of success for that movement. And I think maybe other movements are going to be, you know, 
you know, we, I guess everything speeds up as we go into the future. I want to just bring into the conversation how institutions um, are, are interact with or uh, part of dissent. Um, and particularly the one institution that we sometimes associate with dissent, especially an institution that we talk about a lot here at the National Constitution Center, and that's the Supreme Court. Uh, so, so far in this story, we haven't talked about the Supreme Court. Um, but, and of course, on the Supreme Court, dissent is alive and well, and it's mm -hmm. often formalized in the yeah. form of a dissent. Mm -hmm. um, but how does the Supreme Court work its way into the, the story of dissent uh, that you're telling? Well, you know, it's had, a, you know, like, for example, the ruling on, uh, you know, same-sex marriage or the Roe v. Wade, I mean, Brown v. Board of Education. I mean, Supreme Court sort of becomes the last resort for dissenters. And uh, sometimes a major dissent movement gets a case going there and they lose it. You know, it's a setback, but maybe five, ten years later they get another one and then something happens. You know, in a sense, it kind of reflects, you know, one of my students had this insight he mentioned in class discussion that he thinks of dissent movements as kind of a process or a force that's creating a process of erosion. There's this, this establishment. There's these ideas that we have. Think of a mountain, you know, and then the waves crashing against it. And... Uh, and nobody's paying attention to all of this. And then eventually things start eroding so much that a new reality starts taking shape, a new model of how society could be, and it kind of takes, takes over. So dissents can sometimes be a pretty long, slow process, mm -hmm. um, but you need people pushing. The, um, like, take uh, the Occupy movement. I mean, it was sort of, you know, flopped after, you know, several you know, months of really extreme activism. Uh, but I wouldn't say it was a failure because it changed the conversation. It got everybody talking about income inequality. And people, we still are talking about that. You know, so maybe 10 years from now, something is finally done to reverse that process. And people will look back and say, yeah, the Occupy movement was on the cutting edge of that at some mm -hmm. point. So it's, it's something to keep in mind when things ebb and flow you know, in uh, our political discourse. And so to um, bring us a little closer to the present, um, dissent has manifested itself in a few different ways. Um, and one of the critical periods, of course, we've all just gone through is the 2016 presidential election. Um, it's too soon to write the history of that election, um, I think. Um, uh, but It certainly made dissent popular. But I'm <laughs> wondering how dissent figures into that election and af its aftermath. Yeah, well, the election itself is, was kind of an expression of dissent mm -hmm. because both parties were kind of, like, like Hillary Clinton had a big challenge from Bernie Sanders. You know, a lot of people in the Democratic Party were kind of fed up with business as usual, just like people in the Republican Party were. So the entire election, I think, on both sides mm -hmm. is kind of an example, if, if not dissent, then of a tremendous amount of discontent on mm -hmm. the part of a lot of people. And, um, and then, of course, the result of the election has kind of given a new birth of freedom to <laughs> dissent. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, you know, the Women's March, I mean, the, we've never seen anything quite like that before, even though that, of course, has its historical antecedents. On the day before Inauguration Day in 1913, th thousands of women marched in Washington demanding women's right to vote. Uh, and this was kind of, you know, when I was, at, I went to the Philadelphia March and you know, kind of was reminded of that mm -hmm. historical past thing. Um, and then all of these organizations like Indivisible and so many other groups that have formed, uh, basically copying the Tea Party's playbook and trying to influence politicians, going to town hall meetings and disrupting politicians who maybe were in favor of 
uh, voting against the Affordable Air Care Act or um, you know, doing a, you know, away with funding for Planned Parenthood. Don't you think that um, uh, the president's base of 30 percent were people who were fed up with the Republicans and the Democrats, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore um, uh, they, they were saying he, he would be found out in some bad thing, and people say, do you hear us now? Do you, mm -hmm. are you, do you hear us yet? Mm -hmm. And I don't think you do, mm -hmm. but that's another dissenting group. Yeah, yeah. And of course, with with um, with the story, the story we're telling, of course, is the story of America. Um, and in that story, which is yet to be fully told, um, one other thing we've kind of been talking about today is how dissent sometimes finds itself prevailing and becoming the sort of the governing party or the governing coalition. Um, and and one has to wonder what happens to the dissenters who suddenly find themselves in the position of having to govern. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and that's part of the story you're telling throughout mm -hmm. this book. Mm -hmm. It's not the whole story of dissent, but mm -hmm. it's part of the story of dissent, mm -hmm. how dissent sometimes does prevail. Lincoln, mm -hmm. the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, the, the women's movement to a mm -hmm. certain and significant yeah. degree. Yeah. Uh, what other movements are there in this story that we haven't talked about yet? Um, well, you know, there's a lot of, you, know, you think of uh, Coxie's army or the Bonus army, you know, uh, people who are suffering economically, you know, that were, you know, led marches on Washington. Uh, there's a lot of other kinds of movements that didn't really get anywhere. Um, but again, still, they, even when they didn't get anywhere, they did ch you know, enter into the conversation. And some of the ideas that they have maybe get incorporated into other groups' things. I mean, you think of Martin Luther King trying, you know, starting the Poor People's Campaign you know, the, when he was mm -hmm. assassinated. And that really didn't get off the ground. But it's still a huge issue in this society. And I can imagine it resurrecting again at some point. Um, there are, you know, you know, so many, and, and like in the book, there are so many things that, you know, I just didn't even have time or space to include. But one of the things I, I hope people take away from the book is that it's sometimes just ordinary people, you know, on the grassroots, you know, saying something and winding up having an impact, having an effect on change. Uh, unsung people, we, we have our famous dissenters, but there are plenty of them that are not, you know, famous. I remember um, years, several years ago, I was I met Pete Seeger, and uh, I was at the Clearwater Revival Folk Festival, and my, a friend of mine was visiting from Germany, and she was a reporter, and so she was able to get an interview with him, and so I sat there, taking pictures while she was interviewing him, and a wonderful thing he said. Uh, she she said to him, "Typical Germans are always so direct." She says, well, Mr. Seeger, can you change the world with a song? <laughs> and I loved his response. He said, no, I can't change the world with a song. But if I do a song and someone else paints a poster and someone else leads a demonstration and someone else gives a speech and someone else leads a teach-in, together we can change the world. And this is kind of the message of what dissent is all about in this country. Well, after, yeah. oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. bringing about the end of the Vietnam War. And today, and I mean today, we have the young people from Parkland who, have it, who, who are demonstrating. And I'm, I'm wondering if you think that could be the beginning of mm -hmm. a movement that might finally do something about guns in our I, I think so. I, I, it was one of the most encouraging things. But, you know, it's obvious that in order for something to happen along those lines, you're going to need it in every state, going to every state capital and forcing these people that are in the pockets of the NRA and Lockheed Martin and Boeing and all these, you know, 
the weapons manufacturers uh, that you know you want we need our congressmen our leaders to know that we're their boss not these other people and of course it's very hard to do that but it, 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 that kind of passion that you see that these young people have you know whether they're, they're saying this is all bullshit right. <laughs> that you're telling us you know they're calling it out right yeah. As any of you who have ever had teenage kids know that they're ready to call that out, right? So, um, I thought it was great well, one of the one of the great cries of dissent, of course. <laughs> um, well, with our time almost done, I have a final question. Okay. Um, you've written, of course, this great book um, and lived with dissent in all sorts of different ways in both your <laughs> life and your scholarship. Do you have a favorite dissenter? Okay. Oh, I have a lot of them. Um, Pete Seeger is one. You know, like he. Uh, stood up to, I mean, he basically uh, was involved in almost every dissent movement of the 20th century. You know, workers' rights, uh, civil rights, anti-war, environmentalism. And he was vilified, you know, because in the 1930s when he was a student, he had joined the Communist Party <laughs> for, for a while. And, uh, but he just kept on, he was silenced, he was blacklisted 17 years. He couldn't be on television for 17 years. When they finally let him back on, he doesn't get up and sing, you know, Good Night Irene. He sings Waist Deep in the Big Muddy on the Smothers Brothers show, you know, where Waist Deep in the Big Muddy and still the big fool says to push on. Uh, he, he, he just fought everything. And, uh, and he did it all out of patriotism because of his love of American democracy. And yet he was vilified for that. But, you know, certainly, you know, there's a lot of others that I consider, you know, very highly, like Eugene V. Debs and uh, Emma Goldman. She was kind of a feisty old woman. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people, of course, Martin Luther King. And, you know, a lot of unsung heroes. Well, dissent, of course, it also is part of a conversation, um, part of a dialogue. Perhaps dissent arises in part because it's not part of a dialogue or a conversation. Um, but nevertheless, we're here at the National Constitution Center, which exists to have a dialogue. <laughs> uh, and that dialogue will continue even after we formally end today. I want to thank all of you because you make this place possible and you enliven our constitutional debate. And I want to thank our distinguished guests for joining us today as well. Thank you. Thank you.